unless there's specific questions from the board or the commonwealth i'm just going to move on to the next proposal okay the second one is wages 2a uh, we are looking for a four percent across the board increase uh, we have previously presented the testimony of dr amy mccarthy uh, she has covered not only wages but she covered longevity she covered shift differential so i'm not going to belabor that right. point again what you will find though behind amy mccarthy's dr amy mccarthy's uh, exhibits are a couple things i do want to get into uh, the first one is in act 111 interest arbitration award between the commonwealth and the park rangers that interest arbitration award had a term of 2007 through 2011 if you look specifically at page three of that arbitration award um, you will see that dr caldwell the neutral arbitrator in that particular case and the panel recognized that uh, the missed longevity step needed to be put back into the contract for the rangers uh, the history, uh, the Rangers also got behind a step, but Dr. Caldwell, um, after the arguments were presented, uh, decided that the longevity step should go back into it. So that goes along with our proposal in regard to longevity. Um, the, the, the interesting thing is that, again, in another, I'll turn to the next tab, is um, another interest arbitration award under Act 111 between the game officers and the Commonwealth. And again, we have another arbitrator, Stephen Wolf, who in a contract that spanned four years, Jan July 1st, 2008 through June 30th, 2012, uh, if you look at page five of that award, not only, and, and let me just say, that award was issued in April of 2010. So to the extent that we're going to hear arguments regarding the economy from the Commonwealth, um, this is pretty close in time to now. This is only last year. And here we have Arbitrator Wolf issuing a decision where on page five he gave four wage increases and in addition to giving the four wage increases when you turn to the next page you'll see that over the four-year period he gave five step increases so you have a four-year contract with five step increases so again arbitrator wolf recognized the fact that he needed to bring these officers back up and reinstated that missed longevity step. And what was the date on that? Uh, arbitra the, that the panel issued that in April of 2010. The, the board, I should say. That was uh, the neutral was Stephen Wolf. The Commonwealth arbitrator was John McLaughlin and Tony Caputo for the FOP. Thank you. Now, in line with that, and this was, this was a negotiation that I was involved in, um, we actually have a collective bargaining agreement. Now, this is with between the Commonwealth and the Fish and Boat Officers. And let me say this, they are an Act 195 unit that does not have binding arbitration. So the, this collective bargaining agreement was the result of bargaining between the Commonwealth and the Fish and Boat Officers. And if you look at pages 37 and 38 of that document, you will see that the Commonwealth and the FOP representing the Fish and Boat Officers in that particular case issued the identical wage package, including the identical step increases that um, Arbitrator Wolf, Wolf issued in regard to the game officers. So this agreement, although Although it is not dated, you'll see that um, at the signature page, 
that page 100, um, you'll see my name at the top of there. I, that was signed, I think, approximately July of 2010. So here we have the Commonwealth at the bargaining table issuing wage increases, issuing step increases in July of 2010. So, you know, obviously in executive session you're going to uh, discuss what this exactly means in regard to the, the COs and the H1 members, but we, we, you know, we believe that uh, this is strong evidence that the wage, the, wage, the longevity uh, increases that we're looking for are certainly in line with what other arbitrators have issued in regard to um, other bargaining unit members and is in line with an agreement that the Commonwealth made with, with another unit. The next uh, issue would be proposal number 2B. And this is the uh, shift differential. And again, I think that um, Amy, uh, Dr. Amy McCarthy presented some, some valid statistics in regard to the, to the shift differential. The one thing that I would like to point out, if you go right after the proposal, we do have um, for the panel's review, or the board's review, we do have what some of the other states that Amy uh, had referenced, uh, Dr. McCarthy had referenced in, in her presentation, Illinois, Massachusetts, Michigan, New Jersey, New York, Ohio. Now, I, let me say this in regard to comparables. There is no exact science, and this is not an exact science. Uh, but what I think a comparable can show this board is that what we're asking for it's not the highest, it's not the lowest, but it's in line with what other, uh, what other comparable states um, are providing in regard to shift differential. Um, we have behind that, we have some articles that we think might be beneficial to the panel that talk about the effects of shift work on, on employees, um, not only the stress-related issues that shift work uh, poses, but also the, the, the health effects that shift work has. So again, I, I won't get into those, but that is certainly for the panel to review. If we can go to slide uh, number 2C. I'd like to talk now about the classification proposal, and for this one I would like to call Sergeant Tim Walsh up to testify regarding it. Afternoon, Sergeant. Just state your name. Spell your last name for the record, please. Tim Walsh. Is that something? Tim Walsh, W-A-L-S-H. Thank you. Uh, Sergeant Walsh, uh, the classification proposal that we've put forth here, what are, what are we looking to do here? We're, we're looking at adding uh, basically a designation at 10 years and 20 years of a CO first class and a, and a master class. Okay. And at that 10 and 20 year uh, anniversary date, uh, in addition to receiving the classification of first class and master, we're also looking for, for a pay increase, are we not? Yes, we're looking for a 4% of each one, 10 and 20. All right. And you heard that you were here during the presentation that there currently are 7,595 CO1s. Yes, I do. And CO2s, there's 1,170, correct? All right. And you also testified a little bit about yourself and how you became a sergeant. Right. And you did so by transferring or moving to, to SCI Chester. Is that correct? Yes. I started at Long Hanoi, and uh, I, that's where I took the civil service test. And, uh, well, it was a new institution at the time. And quite honestly, most of the billets, if you will, to advance were already filled by people that like I would do four years later by moving to Chester, we're filled from guys that came from Dallas or retreat, and in some cases, Greaterford. And so even though I took the test, and there was a, a rather large group of people, uh, COs, everybody starting relatively within a year of themselves, uh, 
there wasn't a whole lot to do. So in order for me to make that sport actually mean something, uh, transferring to Chester was a viable option. Okay. So you're at Mahanoy, and, and not, not that I want you to give me an exact number or figure, because I don't believe you can, but generally the sergeant makeup at Mahanoy was younger. Is that where you're, I mean, is that, would that be a true statement to? I think that would certainly be a true okay. statement. Okay. So, but for ch transferring to SCI Chester, when would you have had the possibility to become a sergeant at Mahanoy? first sergeant that actually started there and got promoted, it took him almost five years. Okay. We've, we also heard some testimony, for example, um, from one of the trade instructors, Wilkinson, and he said that he had taken the sergeant's exam many times and he had applied for the trades position many times. Have you heard other stories in, in, your, in your role as vice president of the PSCOA in, in your role with the PSCOA members having difficulty transferring or? or there's, there's countless up. I get hear that correct quite a bit. People not being able to. Number one, they're not selected for whatever reason. And that, really, that's not my argument. But there's a lot of them that they want to move on, but there's not adequate avenues of advancement. That's why I think of that. OK. So, and, and that's another added bonus to what we're looking at here by adding these two steps is that it gives them something to work for. It, I, I believe we retain good people because we've lost an awful lot of good people too. There's good people that work in the H1 bargaining unit. I know guys personally that have left to become teachers, um, counselors, parole agents was a hot topic within the last few years, um, local law enforcement, state troopers. Um, I even know a guy that retired early that opened up Kung Fu school. So, we come from a diverse background. Okay. And, and, and now let's talk about um, authority enhancement. If, if, you, if this proposal were to go into effect, and, and I'm a CO1, and we, we have the uniform over there, what type of stripe or what would, what would I get if I made the first class? Well, obviously, I'll use like a military term. The average CO is a slick sleeve. There's nothing on it. So at the tenure, what I would envision is that you would get a strike or like apply the POC in the military. Okay? Now, assuming you were still a CO, when you reach the 20, well, now you get another one. So now you have two strikes, so that would be like a corporal. Then I could twist that the other way. Assuming you're a sergeant, then you reach 10, you get a rocker like a staff sergeant. So sergeants have three stripes. Yeah, three stripes up. So then at the 10 or 20 year designation, it would be a rock or one underneath like a staff sergeant or a, a gunnery sergeant of first class. And then a sergeant at 20 years, what, what would you do for him? Two rockers. Now, in your experience in, in, in the DOC and working at the facilities, uh, having that on your sleeve, what does that do in regard to your relationship, not only to inmates, but to other COs? Okay. I used the term, I think, as a fireman the last time I was up here. Because we literally put out fires not only for staff, but for inmates. Problem solvers. When an inmate gets the sense that there's a new guy on the block, a new CO, what, what happens in that regard? I guess the best way I can characterize that would be like, kind of like a substitute teacher. You know, I, we all grew up school at one time. Kids act up as substitutes there. They, they can smell it. Literally, they know the new guy. And something like that, I believe, or we believe, I should say, would help actually control the inmates. They would look, they know who the sergeant is, they look for advice, it works out. Now, in terms of recognition, is there any thought that there would, this would be a form of recognition to that individual from the DLC? Staff member that, quite honestly, is going to be fearful in some ways. It's 
it's a unique job and we're 